a teaching session are here. Uh, hi, Anastasia. Hi, Emily. Uh, so and and Emma as well. Uh, so it's good to have everyone here. And I am going to turn this over to the three of you. Welcome. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Emma Stanley. Um, I'll be presenting first today. Um, I'm a PhD student at North Carolina State University in our Communication, Rhetoric, and Digital Media program. Um, and I have some slides to share about my pedagogical practices that I've um, you know, been working on this last semester and continue to work on uh, this semester as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen really quick. I believe it is this one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Lovely. Um, all right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, the title of my talk is Passageways of Play, uh, Critical Making with Twine. And um, this sort of uh, pedagogical um, slideshow that I have for all of you is basically an overview of how I would teach my students this uh, particular um, lesson or project and um, how I uh, went about doing so last semester. Um, I taught this for an internet and society communications course, which is a 400 level course at our university, where we're looking at um, the sorts of um, you know, discourse surrounding the history of the internet and the sorts of developments of, um, you know, uh, things such as, you know, interactive fiction and other, you know, uh, sorts of video games and the, the sorts of basis of um, where all of these began. Um, and so for the purpose of my presentation, um, you know, of course, since we're all, uh, you know, researchers in this area, I won't go through the, the, depths of the history of twine and whatnot, um, but I will show an overview of how I would teach it to my students. And so for um, this sort of outline that I've got going here, we're going to talk about what twine is um, at, on a holistic level, um, you know, in, in a way that I would convey this to my um, yeah, typically senior level students. Um, I will provide uh, historical context for interactive fiction, uh, once again, how I would do it for my students. And then we'll talk about how we can engage with wine as a form of critical making. Um, and I also have one of my uh, students' projects um, to show you all. Um, and I have permission from this particular student to show their work and talk about their sort of um, you know, uh, concepts that went into making their project. So, in terms of how I would explain this to my undergrads, I explain this as you know the creation of a world concept, right? Um, you know, I'm I'm sure many of us have engaged with twine um, in a pedagogical sense in the classroom and whatnot, um, but for the purpose of my internet and society course, <clears throat> I was looking at it not necessarily from like any sort of coding or programming standpoint inherently, but more of a you know, just showing how things are so deeply interdisciplinary. Um, so yeah, when I explain this to my students, it's all about this sort of world building concept and how we can engage with that world building um, and the sorts of interdisciplinary uh, infrastructures that we can learn from this, um, you know, and so we do learn some of the some of these coding aspects, we learn, um, you know, how to work with different variables and whatnot. And so it becomes quite um, engaging for my students and they start learning this new vocabulary um, that they might not have been exposed to before. Uh, let me see. Um, next slide here. Um, I'm also trying to like check the, the chat as we go. So if anyone actually has like the thing, like for some reason my chat won't open properly. So um, if there's something in the chat, please let me know. <laughs> Um, so I also define, uh, you know, the sorts of uh, concepts of interactive fiction for my students, and I always ask them, like, do you guys know what this means? And um, generally, the sort of, you know, premise that we start from is, no, they're not exactly sure what this means, but then I start describing some of these things to them, and 
slowly, you know, they begin to realize like, oh, I actually have engaged in all of these things before, especially the students that I have that play video games. Um, and so interactive fiction as this sort of like, you know, um, text-based adventure, this, you know, hyperlinks and pathways and the sorts of almost streams of consciousness um, elements that you can engage with, but we'll get there in a moment as well. <clears throat> So for the historical context for my students, I often, you know, start with uh, some of the basics here, um, you know, the discussion of ed educational tactics and the sorts of things that um, MIT's Scratch does, which is the coding with blocks. And so you can see these visualizations um, occurring on the page and you can kind of see, you know, these, uh, you know, physical interactions happening and, you know, what variables are creating what outcomes or what inputs are creating a certain outcome output and whatnot. And so you can see some similarities on Twine, of course. Um, and, you know, with walking my students through this, I, so, I uh, show them the juxtaposition between these two things. And, you know, I'm looking at um, these, these elements of, um, you know, what, what infrastructure looks like. And uh, this is when they start kind of getting excited because, as I mentioned, I'm not necessarily teaching students that are software engineers. Um, so they start getting excited about these sorts of like elements that they feel like they can now engage with that they felt kind of afraid of before. <clears throat> and then of course I uh, kind of dive back into the beginnings of Eliza and, and, and computational poetry even um, because these are two things that fascinate me. And so I always enjoy sort of exposing my students to these things as well. And here looking at the screenshot of Eliza, um, they thought this was quite funny last semester. Um, you know, when you hear from Eliza is something troubling you and you say all men are alike and um, you know, what's the connection do you suppose? They're always bugging us about something or other you know of course we always get a few giggles from that but like I as I tell them um you know that's the sort of reality of where we started with this computational therapy at MIT right we're engaging with you know this this computer program that was giving us you know basically specific outputs like it wasn't thinking it wasn't actually going through any sort of like serious process of understanding our psyche. It was just giving us these sort of like preconceived, um, you know, uh, potentially like, you know, put together uh, responses that it thought that were appropriate for the time. Um, and then moving forward a little bit, the computational poetry, my example here is House of Dust from 1967 uh, by Tenney and Knowles. And um, here I just keep going into the sort of um, you know, the, the importance of using uh, different variables. And so here we see the material, the locations, the light source and inhabitants. And so all of these things are continuously being changed up um, to come to this very specific like output where this, this, um, this poem is being constantly generated and this has been preserved online so you can still view this and I you know provide my students with the link to that as well and um, this is generally like a very effective thing like you know most of my students had not been exposed to this sort of thing before um, and so that was fascinating um, to me as well as a instructor. Um, and one of my favorite examples of kind of you know moving forward in the historical development is Tailspin. Um, which is a 1977 <clears throat> um, project where we're trying to teach computers to think a little bit more about their syntax structure. We're trying to think through um, the sorts of decisions that the program is making. So like, this is quite funny because it's still learning here. And so we get, Henry Ant was thirsty. He walked over to the riverbank where his good friend Bill Bird was sitting. Henry slipped and fell in the river and gravity having neither legs, wings, nor friends, drowned. And then Mian says, it didn't know enough about gravity, obviously. And so we're teaching the computer these sorts of things and you know, move, moving forward to simulate more human behavior. And so uh, this sort of development is also always really interesting to my students. And so um, I have a fun time with exposing them to these sorts of materials. And so um, it just makes the engagement with my students so much better. <clears throat> um, in terms of, you know, progressing even further forward in the role playing games, I always mention to them, uh, you know, of course, Zork being uh, the most, you know, prominent uh, 
you know, text-based adventure game um, that's sort of built off of all of these elements that we've discussed so far. Um, and then uh, Travesty in 1984 um, is another good example of where you're inputting these sort of go left, go right, um, you know, uh, uh, elements to control the game um, and we're looking at terms of probabilities you know what pathway might you go down you know things like that so having this sort of um, understanding or at least basic understanding of the infrastructure of how these games are working um, allows them to have this sort of broader view of what we're moving towards in terms of our critical making project um, and uh, I also show them this more uh, modern element here of the Nancy Drew video game series, which has the visuals as well as the clicking different options. Um, and then Had a Full Boyfriend, which is the uh, pigeon dating game slash going to school game. Like you're engaging with these pigeons and having these really weird conversations, right? But it's fascinating the whole time. And so, um, you know, sometimes I have my students play through some of these games uh, just so they can see, uh, even even on like a more silly level, how um, much value there is in understanding these sorts of infrastructures that go into this. And so with that being said, um, I always love this quote from Rettberg um, when we're discussing the fact that um, essentially a lot of literary modernism is tied up in, you know, these elements of interactive fiction, um, especially as they've developed over the years and lots of referentiality and intertextuality and moving toward this stream of consciousness idea where we're getting to really engage with, um, you know, not only the text itself, but the sorts of just narrative functionality that the author is wanting or the designer or, um, you know, illustrators are wanting us to sort of achieve or, or go for and understand. Um, and uh, this, you know, it, we can think about literary modernism in terms of something like, you know, Virginia Woolf, right? Um, you know, she writes in these big long sentences that just sort of like flow ideas together and they're beautiful. And then, you know, we can engage with these sorts of you know, video games or interactive fiction or whatnot, where we can make all of these choices to go down all of these other long pathways. Um, and so moving that forward here, I try to tie all of it together for my students. And, you know, I, the, lots, I know that the concept of STEAM is sometimes, um, you know, uh, contested. And, you know, I've talked about this in graduate classes with my cohort and we're like, you know, does STEAM really exist? Um, and, you know, does it exist in the way that a humanities-based person would want it to work, eat, work? Um, you know, because often STEAM is thought of just the sort of like design concept um, within, you know, like the architecture programs or, um, uh engineering programs or whatnot, but we want to take that a step forward here, right? Um, and so I, I have all of the um, references, of course, at the end of my slide for these quotes, um, but learning through a participatory culture, focusing on elements of design, looking at these intersections of digital literacies and the sorts of, um, you know, varieties of, you know, uh, variables that you're learning. You're learning more about like, you know, development of like software and like computer science, but also literary things, right? Like there's a lot going on here in terms of design. And so how does that lend itself to critical making? Um, this is always the most exciting thing for me, um, honestly, and my students had a lovely time, um, you know, participating in this uh, project um, um, in my class. And so essentially, um, you know, I pulled this quote from 2011, the Ratto quote, um, critical thinking typically understood as conceptually and linguistically based and physical making goal-based material work. So it's this sort of intersection of our critical thoughts um, and critiquing societal or political elements along with the sort of creation of an item. And then the process of that creation helps you form the critique. So it's really more about the process than it is about the specific outcome that you go to. And so it becomes this sort of like, you know, art project that critiques society, but really your engagement with the process of it and understanding how the infrastructure was built is part of that critique. 
And so for this, I would guide my students through um, a twine workshop, of course, of you know how to use it. I have a particular slideshow that I love to use um, that I built over the course of last semester. Um, I guide them through, I give them the tools to do all of this and um, tie all of our interdisciplinary and social critique discussions um, together. And so um, now to sort of wrap things up here, I would like to share an example from one of my um, students. And this is from my student, Jeff, um, last semester. And I, for the purpose of just kind of showing um, what, um, you know, a, a sort of reflection on the project would be, I did paste uh, part of the uh, reflection here. And um, I can share these slides later if anyone would like to uh, read it. But essentially, uh, what Jeff talks about here is um, that he didn't necessarily focus on uh, what people were saying in the game in terms of social critique, but more about the structure of how they were saying it. And so here we start analyzing style and tone, which, you know, it creates the sort of feedback loop for this um, critique, social critique of smart home systems and, you know, privacy discussions. And um, Jeff also mentions that he was inspired by the sort of um, uh, stru structure of uh, Disco Elysium and um, kind of works through that a little bit here and talks about uh, the importance of integri uh, integrity, fluidity, and immersion in the game. Um, let's see. But uh, I would like to show you guys here um, just a few moments of this. Um, I do have this in a different slide. Here we go. Okay. Um, okay. So everyone can see the the twine screen. Okay, excellent. Okay. So here, uh, Jeff tells us that this is a mini game related to smart home systems, and it has four endings. And then he tells us sort of like color coded elements um, of, you know, who is speaking at what time. And so when you play through the game, um, he does have citations hyperlinked to, uh, you know, particular articles. And of course, you can see here for the entire references page. And so essentially what he was going for was um, an interactive essay that also formed a social critique. And so the process of building this infrastructure of you know, building this in interactive fiction game on Twine um, allowed for him to sort of engage with these elements of, you know, what it means to have privacy and what it means to, um, you know, engage in discussions with other individuals about these sorts of, um, you know, decisions that you're making throughout your life. And so um, we don't have to play through the whole thing because I know um, I'm almost out of time here. Uh, but you know, he does form this full, like, beautiful narrative, and you get so many different options here. Um, you know, you're told to wake, wake up, there's a sound in your head, you try to open your eyes, but you get a splitting headache. And so it's, it's quite an immersive creative writing experience for them as well. And so, um, you know, voices come from the darkness, he's using these different colors to sort of differentiate, you know, people, but also sorts of like, almost visual rhetoric of um, tone and characterization and whatnot. Um, yeah, and so there's a narrative going, but then also we begin to dive into talking about, um, you know, patching these vulnerabilities, patching, um, you know, bugs, and according to reports of technicians, there's still a risk of leakage in the user's, data, user's database, and so, um, yeah, so you go through all of these different outcomes, and of course, you can go back and forth here. And um, yeah, I just thought that Jeff, um, you know, in, in my playing up through the whole game, which is actually quite long, <laughs> um, you know, he did an excellent job of sort of engaging with all of those um, concepts and, you know, really embodying what I wanted them to get out of critical making. And I know that um, critical making can exist in a, you know, digital format and then also a physical um, because I've done physical projects as well. But for the purpose of this class, I thought that um, he did an excellent job. So these are my references here um, with links to everything that I mentioned. Um, but yeah, um, that's about it for my part. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and we can move over to Emily and Anastasia. I can stop sharing my screen. Do we wanna pause for questions for Emma or do we wanna just jump in and have questions at the end? 
Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> cool. Just checking. All right. Cool. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Emily Johnson. I'm an assistant professor of English in the technical communication track at the University of Central Florida. And I am here today with the great Anastasia Salter, who <laughs> will introduce themselves. Um, Anastasia Salter. I'm an associate professor at the University of Central Florida in English and the director of the Text and Technology PhD program. All right. Um, so here we go. Uh, this image is made uh, with Wombo, and I used the prompts metaverse and virtual reality. Thought I'd share. Um, so back in August 2021, over a year into the pandemic's impact, um, Zuckerberg announced his vision for our collective future in the familiar space, the metaverse. The rush of educational technology startups headlong into the shared vision has been predictable and alarming. <laughs> And while we're not yet revisiting those fun days of Second Life with universities investing heavily in virtual campuses, such real estate maneuvers seem inevitable. With the introduction of legs to the platform's avatars in 2022 and the promise of Microsoft Teams, yay, in the metaverse, the slow migration from Zoom to virtual desks may have already begun. This wave of ed tech propaganda is all too familiar, and as it surrounds us, the lessons of online virtual worlds, social platforms, toxic technocultures uh, hold many warnings, particularly in terms of control and moderation, with the influence of mainstream gaming culture looming over this gamified, avatar-driven, corporatized vision of the future classroom. Um, so as our universities speculate on boxed-in models of education driven by corporate platforms, we turn to open source tools, the next slide, um, of making from Twine to Bitsy and beyond. Together, we look to resilient making as a means of centering code, software, platform literacy in our, cl in our classrooms. Um, and then our second collaborative book, <laughs> Anastasia and I are delving into the ways that we can foster critical making with our students and the public more broadly. And we sort of see this as a way to push back on the metaverse of it all, as well as the corporatization of education. And that's your... So to kick off, I'm gonna talk about a graduate course I've developed, but also just kind of a philosophy for approaching graduate education uh, in this moment. And really my emphasis is on uh, getting students to confront the idea of technology as authored. And this is something we can actually see as a trend in a lot of media production right now. And it's, um, and it's really a shift from our awareness of authors and media franchises and in narrative worlds to our understanding of the extent to which a single author can play an enormous role in reshaping our platforms and technology. Uh, and of course, the extent to which uh, white masculine visions have had a disproportionate level of control over our platforms. And of course, uh, Elon Musk, uh, depicted rather stunningly uh, by Zach Braff in Moonshot, uh, which is far better than the Glass Onion portrayal for those looking for Elon Musk portrayals in their lives, uh, is the iconic example of this type of figure and kind of the, alongside Mark Zuckerberg, presents the type of kind of voice driving technology right now uh, that we have some opportunity to disrupt and address through pedagogy. And of course, I like to have these conversations alongside both narratives from electronic literature, but also drawing in and recognizing the role of narratives in broader popular culture in shaping our understanding of these types of figures and the way we engage this type of imagery. And of course, uh, the analyst in the recent Matrix film, but also uh, stories everywhere from uh, Upload, currently on Amazon, highly recommended, <laughs> uh, to uh, Ryan Reynolds' reckoning with uh, self-awareness over in Free Guy. All of these types of stories are at the, the forefront of some of our popular culture right now as we are really at a reckoning with the tech boy auteur. 
So this is kind of an extension of the framework of toxic geek masculinity uh, that Bridget Blasian and I collaborated on for years. Uh, and it's kind of the extension of what happens when toxic geek masculinity controls all of the platforms shaping uh, much of our classroom. And of course, the uh, metaverse in particular uh, and machine learning tools uh, for that matter as AI has taken a uh, center stage at the Zon conference and many of our conversations uh, are the epitome of this uh, type of tech boy authorship and of course uh, threaten to play a disproportionate role in how we educate in the future. So I have a, a syllabus uh, I'll share with you that some of the readings I use to, to really shape these conversations, but this is where uh, feminist and anti-racist work in, of course, the, the wider world of internet research and social media can be a great accompaniment to conversations around electronic literature, it can be a great uh, kind of framework for engaging with platforms and tools and understanding where we move away from tools that are, say, controlled by uh, single authors or require a uh, corporate investment to sustain towards thinking about open source and also understanding the limitations of open source as a labor model. Uh, so these are just a few of the ones that I, I tend to, to teach alongside the, the platforms with which we shape electronic literature and digital projects. Design justice, I particularly recommend uh, to those if you're looking for a framework for thinking about uh, the critique of, of technology as well as principles for more inclusive design moving forward. Algorithms of oppression, of course, is a fantastic way to frame our relationship with both uh, search engines and machine learning tools. Bias of information uh, and your computers on fire are both edited collections that offer a wide range of perspectives and ways to engage the current state of technology and also to push back against and, and challenge some of the assumptions about how we uh, move away from where we are right now, particularly in terms of whether uh, kind of learning to code or uh, using uh, the master's code to riff that framework uh, is, is even a possible way out uh, of a corporate platform driven world of education. So all of this uh, work uh, falls into the framework of critical making and the course I teach at the PhD level is uh, framed as critical making for humanist scholarship with the goal of getting uh, students to think about how both in their scholarly work in their classrooms, they might break out of traditional patterns of making as well as uh, their reliance even on some traditional institutions and structures for the circulation of scholarship. And the tradition of critical making is very old, but has often been associated strongly with the material space. And I, I think that is in actually in part because the material uh, space is one of the areas where we can feel and control. And I like to start my students with the material and then work into thinking about having that same relationship with the digital. Uh, and of course, uh, Granite Hertz frames this all uh, through the lens of the value of doing something yourself as an amateur, which is a really great way uh, to get PhD students to, to think about both the assumptions uh, in their expertise, but also to confront uh, the sometimes frightening to humanity students world of code. And uh, this type of production process and kind of the emphasis of it when we think about kind of the tradition of critical making has always been on uh, forcing yourself to approach something as a non-expert, to think about what it means to take control of every part of a labor process and in doing so to take a different level of ownership of that work. And of course, uh, the more of this type of making we do with tools where we can see under the hood and we have a more extensive level of control, the more we become aware of the many constraints that other systems and platforms place upon us, right? So I like to take my students out of even something like web courses and Canvas and talk about how would you have actually designed and laid out your course if you were not forced into this system of modules and pages? Right? Why are we allowing some of these structures of tools to so strongly influence our making? And what does it mean to break out of some of those structures and patterns and play? And to get my students into that kind of 
framework uh, and mindset, I start with something that really uh, begins in the material. And we, we begin with uh, literally self-reflection inspired by Joe Walker Redbird's work. Uh, this is always fun. I've had students make their selfies out of everything from wood carving and embroidery to plants uh, as they think about the relationships of themselves and their materials. And then as we progress through the semester, we're working often with traditional kind of electronic literary forms as well as traditional digital humanities forms, moving from tool to tool and thinking about uh, the ways in which their work can better reflect their values and goals. And this of course is uh, using open processing, which is a really great way to get students using P5JS and uh, making and experimenting with code and seeing the connections between the uh, code layer uh, and the potential for grammar and computational manipulation that then feeds into understanding and thinking about the black box of things like machine learning. So how do we uh, kind of deconstruct the platforms? And through the process of what Natalie Lovelace calls research creation, reimagine this type of work together. Uh, and if you haven't read uh, Natalie Lovelace's Manifesto for Research Creation or How to Make Art at the End of the World, I highly recommend it. It's an incredibly timely feminist text. Uh, and it also uh, centers both kind of the classroom and uh, a curatorial lens, but also a way of thinking about reshaping the university that's very active and uh, compassionate. And as we think about, right, Right now, the state of the university, of course, as Emily and I are live from Florida, we are very, very aware of the different ways people are trying to reshape the university in their image. And so this type of feminist intervention uh, becomes critically important, not just for what students create, but especially, I think, with graduate students for getting them to think of themselves as people who can take that type of ownership and who can recreate the university. Uh, at a time when many of our graduate students and frankly faculty feel an incredible lack of agency in the face of these structures controlling their classrooms and kind of future prospects. So I'll, I'll end with a quote from Loveless here. It's uh, really a bit call to action reminding us that so much of research creation and so much of what we do as scholars and even in our pedagogy has been driven by institutional desires to increase university funding profiles, but it must have everything to do with the longer interdisciplinary feminist and other social justice shifts and how we do arts and humanities thinking. And uh, we are at a moment where the, the platforms that we work with and are prepared to converse on are attracting such a level of popular attention and speculation and bad op-eds on chat GPT destroying uh, higher education, that we are particularly well positioned as a creative community to do some of this work. Uh, and the more we can prepare our students to do that work, I think the, uh, the better off we'll hopefully all be in the face of our collective future. I'll pass this back to Emily. So I moved your slide. That was yours. <laughs> oh, you did. Well, that's where it is. That's where the repository is. <laughs> so all of these things are online, open access, and shared. They're informing the uh, open access book uh, that Emily and I are working on right now, which will will put these things in a critical conversation around the why and how we do them. Uh, but right now, you can see all of the activities, tutorials, resources, code starters, the whole framework for that course, and you can see the previous iteration that's on GitHub with version control. Now I'll pass it off. <laughs> now it's my turn. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, tools for the digital humanities, which is an undergraduate class in many ways. Most of, most of the ways modeled off of that graduate class that <laughs> Anastasia did. Um, but it's an upper level undergraduate course that's one of two required courses in the digital humanities minor, along with a list of electives. Um, I designed this course to follow the university's guidelines for high impact practice research intensive uh, course. So um, because I do all the things all at once, why not? Um, students create digital portfolios and then 
use them to post the remaining projects um, using different digital humanities tools. And then I decided to center the course around a critical making perspective. <clears throat> so I'm not only introducing them to a bunch of digital tools, but I'm also introducing most of them to the idea of critical making and to the library. Many of them um, commented that this was the first course that they had ever had where they had to use the library as an upper level undergraduate. So that was exciting too. Um, go ahead to the next slide. <laughs> so the first time I taught it uh, mixed mode, yet somehow also twice a week, I assigned the portfolio for their projects. And then I did um, tracery and cheap bots done quick. And then um, let's see, Twine, Arcus story maps. And then they chose one of those um, three things in the middle there to revise and add to um, do some more research behind it for their final research project. Um, and then, yeah, a bunch of them used the story map for the research project at the end and embedded some of the earlier projects into it, which was really cool. They didn't have to stick with the same topic throughout the course, but some of them did. So yeah, it was really fun. Uh, so then go ahead to the next slide. The um, I taught it again this past fall, fully online. So naturally I expanded it to choose your own adventure where the students could choose um, three or four different options for each of the tools. Um, and then I did it by like category kind of thing, right? So I did digital portfolio where they put everything, the digital narratives, um, place and space, uh, digital analysis. I dropped Twitter bots this semester because of things happening out in the world. And I had them choose any of those projects to update and expand for their final research project, or they could create like a whole new fourth work, which a lot of them did, which was interesting to me because it seems like more work, <laughs> but that's what they did. Um, each project included a research component. I like to sneak research into fun things, <laughs> like putting peas in their mashed potatoes. <laughs> um, I don't really, they don't really know that they're doing it at first, right? I start with like a little abstract and I call it an artist statement. And then they have to have like one source so that I know that they didn't just make up this whole topic, right? And then the next one, it's two or three sources. And then by the time they get to the research project, Turning in an annotated bibliography with 10 sources doesn't seem as bad. Um, they're allowed to keep the same project throughout, and some of them do, and some of them don't. Like I, it was sort of a mix with this one. Um, so in the next slide, I'll go through. Yeah, and I've listed, I've broken out into different slides, the different options I gave them with the links. And I put the link to this, the slides here in the chat, and then also on the Miro board. Um, but I listed all the options. I did say that they could ask me to use a tool not listed for any of the like units. Uh, nobody did. <laughs> so there was that. For digital portfolios, I provided resources on Wix, WordPress, and Google Sites. But I said, if you already have you know, a, a portfolio, just add to it. That's totally fine. Um, it was really just a vehicle for the other projects. Um, and like the writing component was an about me paragraph for that one. All right, so the next slide um, shows the digital narrative options. They were pretty well balanced between Twine and Bitsy. Um, I had a couple of like timelines as narratives, like curation as narrative in Genially, which is the image on the right there of the slide. Um, it's interactive, but that's a screenshot. <laughs> uh, nobody attempted Omeka, which was also an option. I don't, I don't know why. I then had to download it, maybe. I don't know. Um, the next slide shows the place and space options. The fan favorite was hands down Google Earth layers. Um, it was very approachable, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> for my undergrads. Um, I did have a few story maps. Uh, nobody attempted AR, uh, which was a little bit of a relief. I'm sure you're picking up on the irony of us pushing back on the metaverse with the metaverse, with Spark AR <laughs> as a meta <laughs> product. Um, next slide talks about the digital analyses. They were pretty evenly spread out um, between those three options, Buoyant, Antconc, and Tags, despite my attempt to ignore Twitter over the semester. Um, many of them had learned Tags in another course and ended up combining their results from Tags into Buoyant to make a nice little word cloud, which was fun. Um, do I have another slide after this? I think so. One more. I have to say that it went... So it's everything all listed out. It went much more smoothly than I had anticipated it would. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot of technical 
difficulties or students complaining about the, the technical projects and stuff, which was exciting. I had optional um, Zoom class separate from my office hours, like special for this class. I had them vote on the time and like three people showed up all semester. So that's usually an indicator that there's enough resources out there for them to figure things out on their own, which was good. Um, they had all seemed to just select the tool options that best fit their ability and or like willingness to commit time <laughs> to each project. And I think they really appreciated having lots of options, which was good. Um, so I think, what's my next slide there? Next slide, last slide, where am I? There we go. Oh, there's our pretty book. Um, but yeah, we'd like to hear about everyone else's ideas. Clearly, I need more for this class that I just talked about. Um, but I'd like the idea of trying to get like the critical making and the pushing back and all this like data feminism we've been talking about into other classes. Like I sneak research into everything. I'd kind of like to sneak a little bit more, um, you know, critical making and, and those kinds of concepts into like the more traditional classes or just hear what everyone else likes to, to do because that's that's our lecture. <laughs> um, I did put our um, slides in the mirror board and I see there's already lots of awesome activity over there. I linked my, somewhere I linked my syllabus to there because I don't have it on GitHub, it's just a PDF. Um, but yeah, go ahead Anastasia. And uh, in the tradition of that camp, we're really just here to steal your pedagogy ideas now. <laughs> so the more uh, kind of we can all learn from each other's classes, that's really why I've started putting all of my courses on GitHub. So every syllabus I have is out there. It's a trade. We trade. <laughs> Borrow. <laughs> oh, I see a question. Sorry. Um, it was not independent. Go at your own pace. Um, all of the units were my, my online classes have like set deadlines so I gave them two to three weeks per project I called it a lab and um yeah it's listed out in the syllabus there too if you want to see it sorry other questions things folks would like to share uh oh how do you grade <laughs> with the rubric um yeah I can't I can't think without like I can't put numbers to things without like a set rubric and I just do it really generic. Um, I can pull it up. Uh, I had my whole class pulled up here and then I lost the whole tab. Okay. So I have a generic ish rubric that ends up suiting most of the assignments, which is really weird. I don't know. I didn't think it would work out that way. But um, I don't know if I can copy and paste from Canvas, but I look for like the narrative or the project is complete, interactive and polished. So that's one rubric item, um, has to have a critical making statement. And I break that down for them. I said, it needs to call attention to crit question, critique or celebrate some aspect of humanity. Cause I don't want them to get grumpy about having to be grumpy about everything. So if you want to pick something to celebrate, cool. That, that's critical making for undergrads too. Um, and abstracts is another section. And then the citation, they have to have what, you know, however many citations for each one. There's a question for Anastasia in the chat. Yeah, and I grade just based on completing the thing. So <laughs> my courses are notoriously, yeah. <laughs> Call it what you will. It's really just, did you do the thing? Awesome. Did you not do the thing? Sad. Yep. But, oh yeah, um, Anastasia, I had a, a question for you in the chat. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the selfie prompt that you mentioned and the sort of like process and outcomes that you've seen from that. Yeah, sure. Let me share my screen for a second. Um, this is... This is the page that the students actually see. Uh, so for every assignment, it's uh, fundamentally kind of laid out with uh, structures and examples. 
So the selfie is really, it's the introduction week. And the, the goal is to get students to break out of their assumptions about what a PhD course looks like, <laughs> uh, to get them to introduce themselves through something that's a material object. And I give them guidelines that are, are every week with three things to focus on as they are making. Uh, and then a lot of the, the work is in the documentation and reflection. So it doesn't really matter what the outcomes are week to week, as long as they've processed and reflected. Uh, in the selfies, I've had that in everything from Legos. I, I've given them examples of like a mosaic, Smith Brody art. I show them a bunch of people's selfies from the art world, as well as just uh, crafters having fun uh, and ask kind of where we draw the line and why we do have cultural distinctions around how we talk about art and craft and give them that kind of opportunity to think about where their own work falls. And so since the selfie is the first week, I give them a very detailed process reflection example where I talk about how I was making, I take um, digital tools to inspire things, lay out working through the material, show them that this is what I did in three hours. <laughs> it's okay to have things uh, not work out perfectly as planned. Um, document kind of each stage of it and then kind of talk about um, how the kind of what the results kind of reflect uh, of the intention and what also didn't work out. So this one really kind of gets them started. And then as we go out through the semester, right, it's all about expanding on those tools. So we go from the image to the image text and look at Nick Sasanis's work. And now we're focusing on visual exploration, making a mini comic, working through, starting to, to bridge some of the digital material. And uh, same as before, I give them examples, um, start getting them moving. So every week they've got that kind of set of examples as well as inspiration from other people's published work. And every week I have a different interview with someone who does cool critical making work, including some of the people here <laughs> have done these for me in the past, uh, so that they also get to hear somebody talking about their own process and what they make. So it's a fully online course. So the focus is really on going through those materials and like Emily, I'd use the optional Zoom sessions to kind of keep it going. But unlike Emily, every single week, something is due. Every single week, they're making something. And that's why I start out the course pattern of like, you really want to spend about three hours on your making. So you have time to document and write your reflection. You have to abandon the idea of perfection on any of these things <laughs> because you're going to have to rush to the next one. That reminds me too, um, I have my students reflect each week on like their progress towards their project um, in a discussion board. We piloted Yellow Dig this past uh, semester, which the undergrads liked. My graduate students didn't like it, but um, that we emphasize, we really try to emphasize like process too. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I have a question, sort of a question and, and like an expansion. You mentioned a design document and I'm sort of curious, I think someone did, and I'm curious about that because with my interactive courses, um, I have students or digital courses, I have students do design intention statements uh, that they hand in with their projects, but I don't read them until after I've experienced the project to see like what that alignment is between the intention and then the project itself um, and it's something that's been really useful particularly for students to get them thinking about that that they're making a thing and often particularly entwined they're also making an experience so how are they crafting that how are they guiding the player how are they sort of shifting people through like sort of specific aspects of what they want them to experience and that's been really um I think really really important and generative for students to get them shifting into a different maker mode because they're also thinking about the reception then and that's then the design intention statement comes in as something which they do like they're they're doing it after 
but because it goes in with the sort of the piece itself, it's also their project checked. Like they don't realize this, but it's where they're actually then thinking through, this is what I want this to do. Have I done it? And then they also, they do like lots of play testing and stuff. So I'd be interested to hear, I think, I think Anastasia um, or Emily, someone just mentioned a design statement as well. Did that come up? Yeah, I have them do an abstract with each thing. And then I said, like, I, I, I trick them because I tell them it's an artist statement. Like, this is what this is meant to do. Yeah, so same idea, sort of. Um, I The abstract is more, a little more formal. I tried to match it actually with like the abstract that you would put in with an ELO project or, you know, something along those lines. And then in the discussion post or yellow dig or whatever we're doing, I have them sh share their project and then reflect on their process. And there's some interesting back and forth, like, oh, how did you get this to work? Oh, I tried this, but it didn't, it, you know, it didn't pan out. And then they like, they build this little community of, oh yeah, everybody else doesn't know what they're doing either. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I like that too. I, I'm, I wrote down though design intention because I might I, I like the idea of having it a little bit more formalized and like really thinking through what was I trying to do sometimes I don't know when I create things that I was trying to do at the start I don't know I have a question also for Emily um I'm just wondering when I was looking at your your um the sections in your undergrad course I'm wondering how do you frame the um the portfolio segment right how do you contextualize it like why are they doing it what do they read as well as like the location-based segment um and yeah just curious for myself sure um let me pull it up because I don't remember things very well. Um, yeah, for the most part, like I, I require a digital portfolio in pretty much all of my classes, like regardless of what the topic is. I um, pitch it to the students as like, these days you're going to need a digital portfolio in order to, you know, submit with your job application materials, just like be ready. And sure, you might not, want to submit everything that you have on here when you apply for a job but it's a great start because then all you have to do is delete <laughs> or add and curate rather than scrambling to come up with you know wait where do I even start with a digital portfolio like the night of the deadline of the application um, which resonates with many of them when I when I pitch it that way um, I'm trying to find here let's see the um the module so i have them let's see this is oh sorry i'm whispering one okay i have both courses pulled up and they look very similar so do you want me to share my screen here i it's the early oh on it's the first obviously it's the first thing that we um, there we go. Sort of. It's the first thing we do. Um, okay. So there's my welcome module. It's a bit long. And then, um, they have, they have a couple weeks to get the, the portfolio done. So I have them I do a little overview and then I have a little lecture on what even is critical making. I have the writer reading couple examples, mostly from people in this room, <laughs> um, and then the explanation of the portfolio and then some resources. And then I do have some examples, like the worst portfolio ever is one of my favorites because it's like every mistake you, sh you shouldn't make. And then the companion page explaining these are mistakes because I've made, I've made the mistake of just showing them that and many of them copy that. <laughs> And um, I'm 22 years old and I'm, I don't have any experience. It's like, okay, let's, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. And then I have them choose. And then I have a little blurb for each one just to help them out with choosing if they're stuck. Um, and then don't purchase a domain name. They all want to know why I'm making them pay things. I'm like, no, it's not. 
So that, yeah, that's how I frame it. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> But honestly, it's for me, it's easier for me to find their projects if they are posted online. <laughs> so we have we have a little while to, to chat about this. And I'm interested in sort of things we haven't resolved. What are what are problems we're still having in our teaching? And you know, whether anyone can offer advice, solutions that we we've found. Um, anyone have something that that they just haven't been able to to address or overcome in terms of teaching this kind of stuff? I mean, I struggle sometimes to get the paperwork through, uh, through the university systems uh, with uh, sort of admin processes that they want you to have an essay or a test and they want you to have a set text and I mean, basically, they want you to be a history class. Um, and and so what sort of creative approaches have y'all taken in the uh, verification process to be able to get some more creative uh, classes on the books? Other than just lie, which is often what I do. We just had a minor issue recently about um, new courses being proposed that didn't have assigned readings, like required textbooks. And it was like, well, we have all these PDFs for all these different things, you know, lined up and we, you know, didn't even violate copyright. We're going to pull them from the university library into the university system. And there were, there were issues. I assume they were resolved because I didn't hear any more about that, but that, surprised me that they're wanting a textbook like that's just so I, we're so beyond that now aren't we <laughs> yeah I think um at my university it's sort of a similar thing like we get harassed by the bookstore like for months um and so as a formality I have to submit like something and so I just pick a book that I know that I'm going to pull like the ebook version of from the library and you know I submit it but then on the first day I tell my students like hey this is actually available for free through the university here's the link do not buy this um, because I hate the idea of making my students spend like two hundred dollars and I know that we all hate that um so yeah, that's um, uh, but yeah, we still get harassed by the library or, or sorry, the um the bookstore every year. So haven't found a way to get them to just stop. But um, I think that's a, a fundamental difference of, between American universities and British universities, and that British universities don't have bookstores. Um, so there's no money to be made off of selling books to students. And in fact, they it's the opposite. They would like us to not require the students to purchase things and the libraries purchase everything necessary for the students. And in fact, like like downloading the PDF from the library and offering it on our, our VLE uh, would be, the library doesn't like that. The library would like the students to access it through the library. Um, and that helps us uh, additionally, because um, if the more students actually use the library systems to access things like papers and books, the more the library knows that it needs to keep those subscriptions um, and not shut them down and, and you know, prevent us from having access to them. Um, so it's, it's interesting how different systems um, have different approaches to, to forcing us to do things. Yeah, um, sure. mm -hmm. American oh. bookstores, absolute capitalistic hellscape. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm side. old enough to remember the days when if it wasn't a textbook and it was a collection of like essays or papers that they would also make money off of putting those together into a like a comb bound uh, book for that particular module and you'd have to go and buy it for 40, 40 bucks or something. So um, yeah, it's uh, interesting. I guess you don't do that anymore. <laughs> Anastasia? 
then on the other side, there's the writing requirements. We have this idea of Gordon Rule courses, which have to you have 6,000 words of writing. So when I'm teaching a course like my science fiction course right now, and I'm gonna have to grade 6,000 words of writing, plus some of it has to be revision. So they have to have an opportunity to iterate. Of course, I end up assigning a final paper. There's no way to assign a uh, more creative project and fill that in and meet the requirements of the Gordon Will course. It's so what we've been wild. doing is pushing for things not to be designated that way when they're gonna have a create more creative component, but they still have to get enough to meet the university requirements. Right, it really, they really want us to teach people how to write essays and it's like, how many, how, how it's, it's hard to relate that skill to, to the real world that they'll go on to unless the real world that they're going on to is academia. Um, and so the, the percentage of that is so small that, you know, I, I think more creative approaches, more formative approaches are, are needed. Um, for the research intensive designation for mine, it was really interesting that they didn't require the writing. Like they were, they were ready to see projects as research, which was really cool. Um, but I had to convince them I had to do more work because it's a interdisciplinary board that you go up, you know, the committee or whatever. And I did have to do more work convincing them that critical making was in fact research. Like I had to like lay it out for them. <laughs> we're also running into ownership problems so because games and interactive media belong to a different department film belongs to a different department the communication school thinks they own social media so when we try to propose courses we've had several shut down including a literary gaming course that was mostly reading novels and games as literature uh, and we're still fighting over that arbitrariness and you know that in those other disciplines they're not teaching them the way we frame them in electronic literature they're certainly not teaching novels i'm not sure they read them so there it's it's very frustrating uh, and i don't have a solution there this is pretty much just a complaint that the siloing of the university has really limited creative work and caused multiple frustrations with any types of interdisciplinary class proposal mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which is why um, that electronic literature course over there ran as a special topics course, so I didn't have to fight anybody over it. <laughs> um, I see there was a question. Um, Dina's asked, uh, Dina, do you want to ask about determining ELIT works? Sure, and that was really going back on to what Anastasia was just saying. We, we've now had about 30 years and we've been trying for 30 years you know, to get these works into the curriculum and to get them into even just general, general literature survey courses. Um, and was wondering what the status of that effort was. And you've, you've pretty much explained it, Anastasia, that there's a lot of stove piping. So it's difficult to combine, but could there be ELIT classes? I mean, there can be ELIT classes, mm -hmm. but it's going to be like every other genre, right? It's a, it's right. a specialized course. I mean, I'm teaching science fiction right now, and I'm teaching work in many cases that should be part of literature survey courses as far as I'm concerned, but it isn't either. <laughs> I teach a comics course with things that should be part of general survey classes and aren't. <laughs> so electronic literature is just one of many uh, silo of media forms where there's an assumption that it's a specialized interest. And I do think that right now that's particularly unfortunate because we have all of these colleagues who think that generative text is new or having a computer write a text is new and that's <laughs> exhausting and sad. <laughs> it's right now we can't necessarily easily get people to engage with that but there is an opportunity in all the chat GPT prices nonsense to to step in and your departments and programs for those who are in that position and try to be the experts and say look this is not new <laughs> here's how we've engaged with it in the past here's how you can frame it for people in a way that is uh, productive and encourages both critique and engagement rather than immediate moral panic 
Yeah, in the right, immediate world, kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Right now, my, right, like uh, UCF, uh, the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning is going to have a chat GPT workshop and know they're going to have a syllabus policy for how to make sure your students aren't plagiarizing with chat GPT. It's like, first of all, they won't be able to afford to plagiarize with chat GPT soon <laughs> if they can even get it to load. <laughs> uh, but also, how dull, how tired <laughs> this response is that we must go through every time there's a shift in technology. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just saying in the chat that that the different it's another difference between US and UK universities, um, because the UK does not do liberal arts um uh, or a liberal arts approach to degrees. Um there are no survey courses, there's no 101 type course. So every every class that the students take are essentially in their major. Um it, it's there are good things and bad things to that. Obviously, there are bad things in that in, the, in that British students can stop taking subjects that they don't like um, as young as 14, um, which means that I get a whole lot of writers who don't understand basic physics, basic biology, you know, fundamentals of history, this sort of thing, because they just they didn't like that subject. And so they stopped taking it. Um, just try teaching Pamela Zoline's Heat Death of the Universe to a bunch of students who don't know what entropy is. That's super fun. Um, yeah, so so no, there's not really anything in the place of surveys. You'll get, you'll be able to like, you have a year one level course of something, a year two level course of something, and a year three level course of something. And by year three, you're more differentiated. Um, so like, um, if your area of teaching is creative writing, um, you know, you get to pick the text that you teach with. So like I, I, my year one creative writing course was, you know, when I took it over, it was your bog standard, read some short stories, write some short stories. And by the time I was done with it, it was, we were reading, uh, comics, twine games. Yes. A short story or two. I think I gave up on teaching Heat Death of the Universe because I got tired of explaining basic physics to everyone. Um, but but we did a, a wide variety of things and then they have the opportunity to create a wide variety of things. And so it was almost a, a comparative narrative across media course. Um, but it's up to the, it's it's much more up to the individual um and and so you know any course that i taught they would get a wide variety of media in form of the narratives but then um you would get someone else who was like oh i only know poetry so they only teach they will only put in their module poetry so it's it's far less standardized um in terms of the uk um and it can be you still get i think a, the, you get a lot of english departments that are still very, very conservative, very new criticism, um, old white dude type stuff. Um, and and it can be very difficult to to break out of that. Um, yeah. So you're saying that you're having some issues with the science fiction course? Explaining everything from physics to the Cold War. Yeah. It's uh, and I, I do say our our colleagues especially right? the idea of picking up things that also require them to explain code is that step too far for a lot of people right. and so we still have that that fundamental challenge where uh the, the word doesn't feel approachable yeah i can i can see that i i think there's it's 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 very hard to explain to you know, I, we get so many creative writers who start, you know, don't have, I get a lot more um, people who get interested in doing ELET, ELET from fan fiction than I do from gamers and gaming. Um, the gamers tend to be split off into the comp sci and it, it, it also, also often comes down gender lines, but not as much. You, you, fan fiction is equal opportunity nerddom. Um, uh, but, uh, well, ish. Um, at, at least more than the comp sci courses are, I find. Um, and, and so they get, they can be very excited about doing, um, things in different media. 
uh, whereas I think, um, you know, the, the ones that are very focused on, on, I want to be a game designer. I want to be a game developer. There's a lot less interest in, in the wider media sort of thing with, and, and a lot less interest in design and narrative. And it's all about how, how great coding is. And, uh, they tend to be one trick ponies, which is very sad. Is there anything we can do within this university system and within what's going on now? And I know, you know, we haven't even touched the wider topics of education at the moment. To, but is there anything we can do to get that um, innovation, that interaction again between disciplines and to... I mean, I think we're doing it. You know? I think you're seeing like three examples of, you know, you mentioned the STEAM education and... Um, I think it's getting in there. What do y'all think? I mean, you'd have to recreate the neoliberal university from the ground up. I, I mean, we are, I mean, you think about the history of universities and they're patriarchal and they're top down. The history of research is imperialistic, patriarchal, top down. Um, this is for us and not for you uh and and you'd have to break the whole system and start again i have a great book uh i can't remember what it's called um when i remember what it's called i'll put it on the marrow board um of basically um experimental approaches to the university and how it could be done fundamentally different um and it's got some interesting experimentations in it but yeah i think I think you either go that route with the fully experimental approach to university um, or, you know, you are stuck in this fundamentally patriarchal, closed, neoliberal system, which sucks. Yeah, um, I had a conversation with my students the other day in an analyzing style class that I'm teaching about how, like, absolutely like classist it is to think that there is only like you know this prescribed area in which you can describe style in English literature and like of course there are other ways to get to the same sort of concepts without using those particular words but I mean there is value in learning those that sort of language to discuss these things but also you don't want to gatekeep it right and so we had a large conversation about like gatekeeping knowledge and like help like disseminating knowledge, but then also making it accessible because not everybody has that sort of like scaffolding built up to, you know, uh, be able to engage with that language, you know, just in society. But um, it also, uh, you know, I, I often reflect, I think on like, you know, progressivist ideas of education and like letting students sort of like lean into, um, you know, like a more, I guess, like Montessori approach of like, oh, you know, I find this Thing particularly interesting and you know back in I think I think it was in England um the the Summerhill school had a very like progressivist approach and essentially it was like k through 12 and like let students sort of like migrate to what they really wanted to do and the sort of philosophy behind it was oh you know when you let a student go off and like do something that interests them themselves they'll eventually come back to like you know like if they're super interested in English you know they'll eventually find a connection to like something in science and then come back to that but like and I get that as a philosophy and apparently it kind of worked for K through 12, but like, you know, when we try to apply that to a university system, at least in the US, like, you know, because of the way that things are so standardized and because of the sort of mindset that our students have in our education systems, it's more of like a, you know, why are we having to take English 101 if I'm an, uh, you know, engineering major, you know, we get that a lot, of course. And so I feel like, you know, as we were saying, you know, it's basically we would have to like rebuild the university uh, structure. And so it's also, it's frustrating. <laughs> I also think that philosophy, there's so many philosophies that are in a perfect world, they would be great, but we don't have a perfect world. Um, so like you can be turned completely turned off by a subject, not by the subject itself, but by a bad teacher or, you know, a, a difficult course or a bad experience. I mean, I had 
I took the same in, in my master's degree. I had the same instructor two semesters in a row. The first semester, we were both, uh, unbeknownst to the other, going through something really bad personally, and we hated each other. Um, the second semester, as we saw each other enter the classroom, we didn't know that we were going to be in the cl same classroom again. And we had to have a talk about, like, are we going to be okay? And we, like, she wound up being my thesis advisor. Um, so, you know, it's not a perfect world. And and if if we hadn't been forced into that room together again, you know, I would have hated what she did, um, you know, and the stuff that she taught. But, it, you know, so, you know, and then we have the opposite, which is that you get people into certain subjects through a cult of personality. And and I've definitely been <laughs> accused of that, that, that I tend to, to collect people around me um you know for the things that I do um and uh, you know and then other people for other reasons so it's it's all a big mix of chaos and shenanigans really um no oh, absolutely and it like takes a while you know as you said to sort of have that sense of self becoming to realize all these things right because it's not something that happens overnight like you know even with where I am now in my research like you know I do a lot with you know art GIS and I do a lot with mobilities and you know because my background is in English but I'm in a inherently like kind of calm department now right and um so I you know I try to do this like really interdisciplinary stuff and that's super interesting to me because I get to do all of this you know coding and things like that and like I um you know I wouldn't have imagined myself like a decade ago you know, being where I am now, because, um, you know, for instance, when I was, you know, undergrad, and I was taking calculus, I was like, Oh, I hate calculus, I hate, you know, coding, blah, 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 you know, and, um, and it was a liberal arts school um, that I went to. Uh, but then, you know, I had a professor say, you know what, it's all connected, and you're eventually going to stumble upon that realization that everything is super interdisciplinary. And I was just like, yeah, right. But then like years went by, of course, and I was like, oh, I get, I get it. Okay, so now like I spend a lot of time trying to like tell my students, and of course, they don't believe me at first that everything is like so interdisciplinary and worthwhile. But it's like, you know, it all goes back to the structure of the university, like, not every student is going to just want to learn for learning's sake. So, uh, but yeah. And, and I, thinking about, you know, calculus and, and and I didn't love math. I got through it and I tested out of it as soon as I possibly could. Um, but I was just saying, I have a notebook sitting right behind me where I'm doing all kinds of trigonomic um, calculations because I'm trying to design a, a piece of clothing. And, and so, you know, if I had learned that, you know, then that, you know, might have made sense to me and and I would have been more excited about doing it. And I think... I think it's a more feminist, I think the interdisciplinarity is perhaps a more feminist approach um, mm -hmm. to knowledge and that, you know, you're using this because we're going to do something, you know, and, and we're using this because we're going to make something. And I think it it's, it's more than just knowledge is important because we're important people and we must rule the world through our knowledge, <laughs> British Empire. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so, and, the, and, and it's completely ignoring all these sort of fundamental feminist indigenous forms of knowledge, you know, like I was saying with, with narrative structure, I feel like it's taken me, you know, so long into my career to go, Hey, wait a minute, narrative structure is lots of different things. And well, I've been doing a project with a friend of mine, um, called women make science fiction where we've been uh, working our way through all of the feature films all of the feature science fiction films directed by women and it sounds like a lot it is sadly not very many um which is why we took on the project to begin with because we knew we could actually watch them all mm -hmm. and the narrative structures are so different women do such different things when they're putting um things together um and it's been completely missed in the whole discussion of of structure and storytelling and and knowledge conveyance and things like that i mean you look at anastasia and behind her is a form of feminized knowledge um and and this is a form of feminized knowledge talking to one another um that that gets left out of of these formal 
discussions of, of university teaching and, and sharing. So um, yeah, let's, let's burn it all down. That's my answer to everything. More, more, more thoughts, more, um, we do have, have 10 more minutes. I'm happy for the discussion to continue because this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> and I will go off on a tangent though, as, as you have seen. Great. Speaking of burning it all down, um, reminded me of a, of a question I had for maybe the hive mind uh, of all of us. We, yeah, I told you, we, we did a we did Twitter bots in the first semester, and then I kind of tried my best to just forget that Twitter existed. Um, but we're, we're wanting a more meaningful way to, to introduce them to the generative text and the procedural, you know, like what else can we do with tracery? Like I've tried the, the Discord bot. It's just not as seamless as the cheap bots done quick. Has anyone found a way to do procedural things that might translate better. They just got so excited to do the Twitter bots. Like, oh, I exist. I have a thing. It's out in the world. And now I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want my class associated with Twitter right now. <laughs> yeah. And as far as I know, there's no similar pipeline for Mastodon. Most Mastodon servers are very unfriendly to bots. Uh, so I don't know if the cheap bots done quick creator has even thought about trying to build a tool for that. But honestly, Given how kind of conduct is managed on most servers, I suspect they'd be banned anyway. <laughs> so I know there's been discussion about creating a server just for bots, so you can unleash bots, but that's also I, kind of restricted and means that students won't be able to, to share it at the same level anyway. So I don't know that that would make people all that happy. Well, when it comes to Twitter, I mean, there's, you can throw stones from the outside and also throw stones from the inside out. Yeah, try to do both, I guess. Be a lot of my students will not give their personal information to Elon Musk anymore and do not mm -hmm. have any interest in creating a Twitter account or having one. So, Fair. and I respect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tough. Dab is tough. Speed. Oh, just yeah also and, i think and, assuming that that tech is going to still work the way it does for much longer is naive it's already it's already crumbling yeah well and this brings us into the cycles that we all have seen now we've uh many of us have been through the 90s and the crash in the 2000s and there is a long history here i, I had noted emma by the way when you were talking about the history of twine you can't stop at 2003. You got to go to Eastgate. And that's another history. But our field, what I'm trying to say, it's it has been littered tour. with, yeah, we, we've been littered with this generation, that generation, this new hardware. Now it's dead. What can we take for robust teaching and this robust making? Is there any lessons that you, principles that you have overall? Principles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what principles do you want? I mean, I'll let Anastasia, this is your panel, Anastasia, Emma and Emily. Well, I mean, like, I'm looking around to see who's going to report me to uh, the story space Eastgate crew here. But right, that is an example of a tech boy auteur who wrote his program, controls it. It doesn't have necessarily a longevity plan to it. And it has an expense that makes it unusable in the classroom. And with Adobe's tools, we had the same thing, right? We had invested in the ecosystem, but ultimately we're in fact, we were investing in an ecosystem that none of us controlled. Twine, on the other hand, is an open source project. It's an open source project that the works are in one of the most sustainable uh, technologies there is. The web as a standard is one of the closest things we've come to in technology to some sort of an accord, <laughs> right? So I tell my students, do not go build apps. Do not go into the iOS or the Android ecosystem if you want your project to have any lifespan at all. 
I mean, ELIT is littered with the corpses of unplayable works that were developed in those proprietary platforms and cannot be sustained. So if you want to build your class in a way that students will have tools that are sustainable, you have to build them on things embedded in feminist HCI principles. I mean, that's why Archive of Our Own is so powerful as an example, and like why I pointed to FanFit, right? That is a platform where community decided to take ownership of where their work was displayed so that things could no longer be uh, destroyed without their consent so that histories would no longer be lost. Yeah, and that's that's what I put in the, the final chapter of, of my book. Ah, shameless plug. I knew I'd get it in somewhere. Um, <laughs> there's a discount code on the marrow board. Um, is is where I talk about our contact lit. It's the open platforms. It's the open source. It's the building upon one another. It's feminized storytelling, and that's what that's the beauty that I think that the digital has given us is the ability to uh, build on one another's stories and to um, to to turn it into uh, the 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 rolling stories, the open stories that we just keep building onto one another. It doesn't, the platform doesn't matter. The technology doesn't matter, whether it's Twine, whether it's archive of our own, whatever it is, we will always have another platform. We'll always have another television or film or stage or book or Twine or whatever. We're always gonna have that. But the principles of um, adapting your story to a medium, uh, you know, working to meet your audience's needs. I like to tell my students that there is no such thing as bad writing, only bad meeting of audience's needs. Um, you can judge Fifty Shades of Grey all you want, but it sure met a, a wide audience's needs, and it was highly successful based on that. Um, and, and so that's, you know, F canon, F, you know, all those notions of, because that's based in uh, hierarchical systems of trying to control the proletariat and keep them from rioting the way they did in France. Um, and so, you know, open it up and, and let people enjoy and love art and, and just use whatever we've got right now and, and give them the principles to Google how to use that tool and, and troubleshoot and build tutorials for one another. And the rest is about communication and and sharing and coming together. I did get on a soapbox, sorry. Wow, that seems like the ending speech of the session. <laughs> even my session. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, we have two more minutes. Any Anyone wanna top that? Well, I guess my question is, if we want to be as inclusive as possible, widen that circle as broadly as possible, then we ultimately do have to reach out to the people that disagree with us most and are on the margins in, in, in a different part, maybe of the sphere. How do we reach them? How do we include them? And can we do it in a university setting? Oh, university setting. No, I mean, I think I think efforts are being made. Um, you know, uh, the last few version, the last couple of versions of the electronic literature collection, we've been trying to push the the push beyond the edges of what's considered elit. Um, so everything, you know, from collection version three, where it was like, let's grab the games, let's grab the twine, let's grab some of these things that are popular. Um, and then we included as much as we could uh, in collection four of like the 360 videos and uh, blog fiction that is uh, because that's what's uh, coming from parts of the world where they don't have the same kind of technology that we do. So Africa and India are, are producing those sorts of works. And so, you know, and, and then works in different languages, that sort of thing. It's difficult. I'm not going to say it's not. Um, you know, I found, I, I struggle, I talk about that a little bit in my book that I struggled to find stuff in English scholarship and that sort of thing. And I'm, we're relying on translations and people who are multilingual to tell us about these things and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it's definitely worth um, making the effort and, and keeping, 
keeping going on those sorts of things and opening minds to what other regions and people and, and you know uh, folks are doing but yeah it's difficult it is difficult and I hate to end it on that note <laughs> I'm sorry. We can take this up. No, it's okay. We can keep this in the Discord. There's actually been a pretty good discussion um, in the Discord about getting the inner let lit into the wild and about teaching it. So let's keep this going. And but I'd like to welcome round of applause. Arna. Thank you. Round of applause for for Emily and Emma. And Emma. Emma. Thank you so much. Thank you.